philosophers who state with confidence that miracles occur all around us every day. And that with a heightened awareness, we will be able to see these miracles, recognize the angels that walk among us. Henry David Thoreau was born in Concord, Massachusetts in 1817, the son of a businessman. Graduating from Harvard, he taught school and lived with close friend Ralph Waldo Emerson. In 1845, Thoreau built a crude cabin on Emerson's land near Walden Pond. For two years, Thoreau searched for answers to life's questions and lived his own philosophy, simplify, simplify. There, he wrote his most important work, Walden. Thoreau believed that people should defy unjust law in favor of the moral good, and he urged them to open their eyes to miracles. He said, men talk about aged miracles because there is no miracle in their lives. Cease to gnaw that crust. There is ripe fruit overhead. At the Miracle Research Center, a team of devoted men and women are putting Thoreau's advice to work, seeking the ripe fruit of new miracles. Hello, I'm Bob Evans, producer of Could It Be a Miracle? And I'm Michelle Wolford, segment producer. Our miracle research team of writers, producers, directors are busy compiling stories for your consideration. We'd like to share a few of them with you in this week's show. Our stories include the tale of an injured young man who is saved by an unexplainable radio transmission. Two scuba divers escape the jaws of a great white shark with the help of an underwater apparition. A legally blind woman regains her eyesight in time to save her daughter's life. An angelic hospital worker calms the fears of an anxious mother. And a bright light prevents a terrible tragedy. We also have interviews with authors Eileen Freeman, Brad Steiger, and Joan Wester Anderson. Yes, our first story comes from Joan's new book, Where Wonders Prevail. It deals with the idea that departed loved ones sometimes bring us messages from above. Once you uh, accept the idea that heaven and earth can interact, then I think you have to accept all the little tangents and, and strange things that will flow from that premise. Um, it's not just one or two ways, it's probably as many ways as there are needy people. I'm thinking of one story told to me by a little nun, Sister Mary Dolores, who had an elderly father. Her elderly father used to love to travel when her mother was alive, but her mother had died the previous spring, and this left Sister Dolores in somewhat of a bind because she had planned a wonderful trip to Europe uh, by herself with some friends, but now there was her dad by himself. This whole courtyard is exactly what we need at the convent. The church is open to the public, and the relics are all safely and beautifully displayed. And I think it was well worth the trip. This is beautiful. Uh, I'm going to write a report to Mother Superior. I'm going to let her know about this. Yeah. You know, I notice your father, he's been moving quite well. Yeah. He has his good days, and then some days are more challenging. Mm. And when he was walking around the courtyard, he mentioned to me quite a few times about the trip to Rome. I think he really wants to go. I think he does, too. I, I, I would love for him to. And I've thought about it, but some days he walks really well, and then other days his equilibrium is really bad. He falls down every time he tries to stand.
and I think, what if we're there and I'm alone with him and he hurts himself? Who's going to help us? I, I, I've got over it in my mind. I just, I don't think I should risk his health. I think he really misses your mother. Matter of fact, I can see the sadness in his eyes. But, look, I don't doubt your decision. <laughs> I got it. Well, let's get on the road before it gets too late. I don't want to get back to the convent at night. Dad, time to go. One afternoon, sister visited her father and took him out for a ride. And as they drove down the highway, they saw a fruit stand over on the side. Maybe they didn't stop and get some produce. Flowers look really fresh. Oh, yeah. Didn't you want to come in and do some shopping? Uh, no, I, I think I'll stay here and read a bit. But you go on, stretch your legs. Okay. All right. Sister went around thumping the melons and, you know, getting the tomatoes and making a little basket of, of fruit. Her father kind of aimlessly wandered, looking at things. It's okay to take your dad on a trip. What trip? What are you talking about? The trip you're going on to Rome. I just talked to your mother. She said it's okay to take your dad, and nothing bad will happen to him. But how could you have spoken with my mother? She died last May. Yes, I know. It's okay to take your dad to Rome. You will enjoy it, and he will be fine. will be fine. For that lady? Well, sister was just astonished, and she didn't know whether to laugh or cry or be insulted or upset or what. So she she paid for the fruit right away, and, and she got in the car and brought her dad around and put him in. And Dad, let's get back to the car. Yeah. This is a nice little spot, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Aren't little places like this somehow closer to heaven? What did you say to that uh, vendor about me going to Rome? I didn't talk to him. You paid him. No, no, not the man I paid. The other man, the man in the hat. I didn't see another guy there. I didn't see no, anybody no, else. No, Dad. There were, there were two men. I mean, there were two. Look. Actually, there would have been no way that she could have not seen this second guy. And she decided to go ahead and take it as a message from heaven. She took her father on that trip, and she took him on many more. He did continue to suffer from vertigo, but he never had a problem when he was out traveling with her. I can't help but wonder how many times we've all received messages from beyond, but have been too busy to notice. It is comforting to believe that there is some type of communication between the here and the hereafter. When we come back, the story of an injured photographer whose life is saved by a radio message directed personally to his attention. Welcome back. Our next miracle comes from author Eileen Freeman. I recently traveled to New Jersey with one of our video crews to speak with Eileen in her home. She told me about one story that suggests angels can communicate with us in a number of different ways. Angels can communicate with us in any way we're capable of being communicated with. As a rule, what we hear our voices, a message that comes to us in a language we can understand. A friend of my father's once told me an angel story I always liked. 
He had gone on a photography expedition to the wilds of Canada with some friends. They had arranged to use a friend's cabin, and after leaving their car, they hiked in. It was a long ways. They got to the cabin, decided the first thing they needed to do was to make a fire. Wow, beautiful place. Not a bad hike, huh? Not at all. I'd like to get a sunset shot of the lake. Sounds good. Figure that gives us about five hours to get settled. How about a little lunch? Sounds yeah. good to me. I'll start it if one of you knuckleheads will get some firewood. That's you, boss. Anything for the chef, right? Weekend. No, this is nice. could take him while they went for help. So they left him lying down with a thermos of hot tea and a bottle of scotch and a radio set to some nice soothing classical music. He was beginning to feel a great deal of pain in his abdomen, but he didn't know what it was. He thought while they were gone that he would help himself to a drink of scotch, thinking that might uh, kill the pain and help him a little bit. But just as he was reaching for the bottle, the classical music just faded away, and a voice filtered in. With this type of injury, the worst thing you can do is let the victim consume alcoholic beverages. Give him something else to drink. He put the bottle down. And he reached for the thermos of hot tea instead. And then this voice on the radio came back. Listen, he may be in shock. Uh, it's very important that you lay him down and uh, elevate his feet. If he relaxes, he's going to be just fine. My father's friend said that his fear went away and he had a feeling that he had been communicated with. And in time, his friends came back with help and I believe he was actually helicoptered out to the hospital where a ruptured spleen was removed and other intestinal injuries were repaired. I believe that he actually had a lacerated major blood vessel leading to his liver or some other organ. And he told the story about what had happened. And they said, it's a good thing you followed that advice. If you had stayed walking around and you had been sipping on the scotch, we would have found you dead. Relax, 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 relax. The postscript to this story is that the voice that filtered in and out of the classical music was from a radio station more than a thousand miles away. And there was no way at all that that little station that actually was a story of some paramedics 
relating a rescue could have ever filtered in to this classical music station out in the wilds of Canada. It would seem, at least from this story, that angels can communicate with us in any way they so choose. Right. Eileen even spoke of one case where an angel communicated with someone via the Internet. One point that all of our experts seem to agree on is that angels are messengers and they'll do whatever they need to do to get their message across to us. Stay tuned for our next story in which a shark attack is narrowly averted with the help of a deep sea apparition. Welcome back. Our next story involves scuba diving. Michelle, I'm sure you weren't aware that scuba stands for self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. Really? Who invented the scuba apparatus? Jack Cousteau. You know, in the world of underwater diving, encountering a shark is not altogether unheard of. But few divers can count on being saved from shark attack in the same way as the two lucky divers in this next story. Uh, maybe if you close to someone. Now, Vivian Landon tells us, in her own words, how she was miraculously spared from a terrible fate. Tell if someone is in danger. I was on Daytona Beach with a friend of mine, Charlie. We was underwater. I was scuba diving. It was a gorgeous day. I was getting some fish, and I had one, and I put it on my belt. So my dad's face, he was right on the front of me. Even though the man strongly resembled her father, Vivian knew that this mysterious swimmer, fully clothed and calmly floating beneath the waves, could not possibly have been who he appeared to be, since her father was at that time on the island of Martinique, almost 2,000 miles away. I looked at Charlie, he looked at me, the vision that my father disappeared. Next thing I know, I saw another big fish. I'm ready for it. And then I saw my father's face again. And he was fully clothed. He had a red shirt on with flowers and the jeans on. And he's under, under the water. It's like coming toward me. I mean, really coming toward me. I'm making all kind of gesture and pointing. And, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And I, he keep coming and coming and coming closer. But really, I'm making all kind of like saying to me, look on the back, look on the back. And I'm turning around, and then I saw the shark. I dropped everything, I dropped the fish, and we just paddled away quick, quick swimmers, quick as we can to the boat. Their desperate swim to the boat had kept them mere inches ahead of the monster shark. Had they waited another few seconds, it would have been too late. What was it she and Charlie had seen? Vivian was determined to find out. Vivian immediately phoned her father in faraway Martinique. She prayed that he would have some kind of explanation for the vision that had warned her of the approaching shark. Hello? Oh, 
I'm so glad it's uh, and I told him, I said, what? Happened to you today? Something happened to me today. I know something happened to you today. He said, I can feel it. He said, I could feel it. He said, I, uh, and were you swimming? Was you under the water? Like were you scuba dead. diving? I said, yes. He said, well, I, I, I know you was in danger somehow. And I was trying to reach you. And I, I finally, I got this vibration that I had to get to you. But I just knew I had to get to you. I, I tried. I, I just had this feeling I couldn't. Yeah, it was so weird. It's like you were Vivian described to her father the exact appearance of her vision, including the clothes that she had seen her father wearing. He even described the clothes that he was wearing that day. Because I, and then I told him, I said, this is exactly the way I saw you under the water. I'm here today to tell the story. Thank God to my father. Vivian believes her father reached out to her across 2,000 miles and saved her life. We've come across a lot of examples where the bond between parent and child can transcend time and space. Is it a miracle or is it with the help of an angel? All we know for certain is that both people involved saw the vision and both lives were saved. When we come back, we'll have a story of a woman who's able to overcome her disability in order to save her daughter's life. And later in the show, a military family avoids danger with the help of a blinding light. Stay tuned for more miracles. Harriet Beecher was born in 1811, the daughter of a liberal clergyman. At the age of 21, she left her native Connecticut and moved to Cincinnati. There she married Calvin Stowe and gained firsthand knowledge of the South and her lifelong enemy, slavery. When Harriet and Calvin moved to Maine, she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, which would become her most famous work. Authorities then believed it instigated the Civil War. As a poet, novelist, and abolitionist, Harriet Beecher Stowe had this to say about angels. Sweet souls around us watch us still, press nearer to our side, into our thoughts, into our prayers, with gentle helpings glide. The Miracle Research Team is fighting for another cause, to make sense of the unexplainable, the impossible. Welcome back to Could It Be a Miracle? Our next story comes from Bob's interview with Brad Steiger. When I spoke with Brad recently, we started talking about the special bond that exists between mothers and daughters. It's a connection that transcends great distances, and in this case, provides a miraculous healing. I know the woman in this story personally. It's a dramatic story of, of a miracle it happened to a mother and a daughter. And for purposes of uh, anonymity, uh, we'll call her Ava Steinberg. Uh, Ava is uh, a very accomplished executive of, of a nationally known firm. She uh, has a slight impediment. I say slight because she's such a dynamic woman, but she is legally blind. She cannot see a thing without her very thick prescription glasses. In this particular case, we have an instance of a daughter calling out to a mother under the most extraordinary kind of conditions. Thanks for a great week. My pleasure. You got a lot done. I think all you need to do is just answer some phone calls and um, just wrap up the week's work. Great. By the way, I'm celebrating my birthday this weekend, and I would love it if you and your daughter could make it. I'd love to, Susan, but I wouldn't count on Janet. She's too busy for us old-timers, huh? I haven't told many people this, but Janet and I haven't spoken in three months. She's going through a rebellious stage, experimenting with drugs and so on. <sighs> Sounds like some 20-year-olds I know. We had an awful fight one night, and she left the house. I haven't seen or heard from her since. You must be a nervous wreck. Why didn't you say anything? I guess I was ashamed. I thought maybe I drove her away. The police can't find her. I don't even know if she's alive or dead. Don't give up on her yet, Ava. It may take some time, but I'm sure she'll come to her senses. 
She was distressed. She had to go on with her work. She kept going to the office every day with this burden on her shoulder. Where is her daughter? Am I going to have to force you to leave? It's going on 6 o'clock. Right behind you, Susan. Good night. Good night, boss. just gets out, Mom, I need you, and that's it. You hear, she heard the, the body fall of her daughter, she heard the phone crash down, and she's calling, calling her daughter's name, there's no response. She realized her daughter is physically incapacitated. And of course, with the drug scene, she thinks, well, it probably is a drug overdose. Her daughter is probably dying, or maybe dying, certainly. She's in a desperate situation now. Where is she? Where did the daughter call from? Did she call from the city? Did she call from another city? Did she call from across the country? She has no idea. She's trying to call into the phone. The daughter is obviously alone. There's no one there to pick it up or respond or do anything. And, but she knows that time is of the essence. She just knows that her daughter is near death. I'm on my way, sweetie. Your mom's coming to help. She knocks her glasses or thick prescription glasses off on the floor and accidentally steps on them while she's looking for them. Suddenly then, there was a clarity that came over her. And even though she can not see a thing without her glasses, because she's legally blind, only blurs out there, she picked up the city map. She was convinced then that her daughter was still in the city, a very large city on the eastern seaboard. She flipped open the map and suddenly, just like a circle under a magnifying glass with great clarity, she sees a street address, she sees an apartment address, she sees, she zeroes in on this block and she knows there. her daughter is there. There you are. Ava, 30 this weekend and I've already lost my mind. I forgot my car keys. Susan, I need to borrow your car. You can't borrow my car. Yes, I can. You can't try. Yes, I can. It's an emergency. It's my daughter. Are you all right? I need you to stay here in case she calls again. In case who calls? Janet? Hold on, sweetie. I'm going to be there soon. I'm on my way. She drives somehow through this major eastern city, crowded traffic unerringly to the city block and then to the precise, and this is a, not in a good section of town, it's a very run down section, the areas there are pretty much crumbling and decaying apartment buildings. She pounds up the stairs of this one apartment building, goes to the correct floor, throws open the door of the correct room and finds her daughter lying in a comatose state, still beside the telephone. Janet, no! Oh, honey, are you okay? Honey, wake up. Oh, wake up, honey, wake up. Hold oh, on there, honey. Now then, she picks up the phone, calls an ambulance, gets the daughter to the hospital on time, saves her life. Hurry. They're gonna be all right. They're gonna be okay, honey. Come on, just a little bit longer. They're gonna be here really soon. 
Here is a dramatic case of the mother, though handicapped, though legally blind, with her glasses broken, when the daughter sent out the call, I need your help, it was given to her. It was given to her like a beam of light from above to focus exactly and somehow, and this is one reason for anonymity because we have a, a legally blind woman driving, <laughs> driving her car through the heart of a major city. She drives unerringly to the place where her daughter is dying and saves her life. So for a mother's love, the miracle of a mother's love, there just are no impediments too great. That love reaches out and connects mother to child, regardless of the circumstances. That story and many others that chronicle the miraculous bond between mothers and children can be found in Brad and Sherry Steiger's book, Amazing Moms. Stay with us. Up next, a story of a woman in a hospital waiting room who receives reassurance from a surprising source. Today, my, my advice is, yes, angel exists. You can find your own angel. The main, uh, the, the, the most important thing is to establish the contact. It's like somebody you try to seduce. It's like, it's like a love story and it's like a marriage forever because it's, it's your guardian angel forever. You know, it's, uh, you're not going to divorce your guardian angel. <laughs> you know, it's always the same. So it's, when you find the contact with your angel, he's able with giving you fantastic intuitions fantastic intuition, putting you in a weird synchronicity. Uh, for instance, you know, being really uh, at the right time, at the right place with the right person. And, you know, more often than once. You know. That's what, what's happened when you are um, in tune with your guardian angel. We're back with more miracles. Michelle found this next story through author Joan Wester Anderson. This is from Joan's first book, Where Miracles Happen. And this is a story that is very consistent with most other angel encounters in that the angelic presence conveys a sense of peace to someone in need. There's a story of a young woman in Louisiana whose baby had um, been very healthy and then all of a sudden developed some mystifying symptoms. The baby was quite young, only a few months old. And Janice, the mom, had to bring her into the hospital. she ought to go for some tests and so Janice was just devastated by this this perfectly healthy child now all of a sudden we're looking at something serious um, they had a pediatric waiting room and there were no other parents in there at all and she started to cry um, she just felt so alone her husband was off on a trip and on his way back but not able to be there at this exact moment this was their first child, and she just felt like all mothers do in a situation like that. How much longer? I need to know now. She needs to come now. Please hurry. Here, let me take her. No, I have to go with her. She's no, the doctors can't help you unless you give her to me. No, she was so healthy up until a minute ago. I don't, I don't understand. It's all right. We'll take good care of her. Please, please take her. Oh, my God. Justin White came into the, uh, the waiting room and sat down next to her. Doctor, how's my baby? I'm not the doctor. And 
There's no need to cry, Janice. I know, but I'm so scared I can't help it. You needn't be frightened. Your baby will be just fine. She will? But the tests... What is it? I looked at your baby. She's going to grow up to be healthy and happy. He had the kindest eyes that she said she had ever seen in her life. She just kind of felt herself relaxing, and she knew that whatever came along, she would be able to handle it. So he kind of gave her a little pat and got up and left. A few hours later, her doctor came into the waiting room, found her, she was reading a magazine. Well, she has to go into surgery right away. It's a simple procedure. She'll be just fine. That's what he said. Who? Well, the man who was here earlier, he said he'd look in. I didn't see anyone here. I just came from the doctor, and we were the only two who saw your daughter. Why don't you come with me, and you can see her for a moment before we go into surgery. When all the excitement died down several days later, Janice went to the uh, desk and wanted to know if she could thank that orderly. And when she gave a description of him, they explained that their hospital personnel usually wears blue and that there wasn't anyone matching this young man's description anywhere at all on the floor, nor would anyone have been able um, or empowered to give her a diagnosis except the doctor in charge. So Janice told me that she had some thoughts about it, but she finally realized that um, Angels exist in hospitals just like everywhere else, and there was no reason at all why her child's guardian angel couldn't have come to her and given her a little word of comfort. As you were saying earlier, that story seems to contain many of the same markings of other angelic experiences. That's right. One of them being an overwhelming sense of peace conveyed by the mysterious messenger. Coming up next, a family moving cross-country encounters a life-saving light. Stay tuned. My guardian angel um, will help me so I won't be scared. He keeps me safe by the devil. Welcome back. You know, I can think of few things in life more challenging than having to move your entire family and belongings across the country. But for those families in the military, it's a common occurrence. As in this next story, where an Air Force family on its way to start a new life meets with a supernatural diversion. I came away from 22 years of service with an area scratch. During all that time, I never experienced anything that would truly prepare me for this kind of miracle. We were stationed in Austria. When the troops were withdrawn, we returned to the States, picked up a new car, and headed west uh, to my new station in California. It was a long trip. Traveling with uh, four youngsters um, was tiring for everybody, but the station wagon was ideal because we could put all the seats down and back and dump the kids back there and just let them crawl around over each other. I wanted to make it through to the next town as soon as possible because it was hot, it was summertime, no air conditioning in the car, everybody was tired. Couldn't find a motel, but we decided to go on through where we drove into the hill country. In those days, uh, the settlements out there were few and far between. We'd been driving for perhaps eight, nine hours that particular day. Most of the kids were jacked out in the back, uh, dozing. My wife was in the front seat with me, and she was dozing. I was pushing the car as fast as I could because I, I was eager to get settled for the evening. I must have been doing 50 miles an hour. About 40 or 50 miles west of the city, I approached a hilltop at the top of which highway curved around to the right. I couldn't see over the hill at all. What's wrong? Dad, what happened? What happened, Dad? 
Are you guys okay? Yeah. Stay, stay here. And I jumped out of the car. And I looked over the front of the vehicle, and on the road in front of me, just a few feet away, was a small child, perhaps 18 months, two years of age. I knew then why I had to stop. I saw a lady running toward me. I handed the kid to her and said, is this yours? And she said, yes, he just got away from me. My wife was staring at me with her eyes wide open and saying, how did you know? And um, to this day, I have no idea. If I hadn't stopped when I did, I would have killed that child. It's the closest thing to a miracle I've ever experienced. If it wasn't a miracle, I don't know what you'd call it. For one little girl, the difference between life and death was decided in a single instant by a man who learned to trust the urgent guidance of a miracle. Many of the experts that I've talked to seem to agree that an encounter with an angel or the miraculous does not necessarily have to involve a physical presence. So perhaps the white light was part of some heavenly intervention. We'll continue to have discussions on this very subject with our experts on upcoming episodes. Until then, we'll continue to seek out stories of the miraculous. If you've been touched by the miracles in this show, if these stories seem amazing to you, then you're probably asking the question we ask at the beginning of every program. The same question we'll ask again next week. Could it be a miracle? The existence of any given miracle may never be proved scientifically, but the researchers will continue to seek out the stories, trying to understand those things that defy explanation. We'll be back next time with more cases. Until then, think about what you've just seen and ask yourself, could it be a miracle? Until next time, I'm Robert Culp. Laura Mustaine.